Hello, I am Robotad, and I am going to be running Death House, which is the one shot in Curse of Strahd. Now, I'm going to be running it, filming it, and putting it on the channel. And because I know I'm going to be doing a Curse of Strahd walkthrough, you know, my usual for DMs to uh, get a little clearer an idea and some alternatives, this seems fitting to go in the playlist. So I'm recording it well in advance. Basically, I'm going to take a look. This is my real prep. I'm going to talk through it as I go. So we are going to be first level characters. Uh, they've already chosen that. What it does mention of importance, I know it's the second time, is that the house itself is actually alive. It's an intelligent form. This is the first people. This is the, this is the, these are the first people that they meet to children. So I'm going to have them walk down a road, gravel road, describe the houses. And then they meet 10-year-old Rose, seven-year-old Thorn. She shushes the boy, explains that there's a monster in their house. Fine. They don't know what the monster looks like, but they've heard it's terrible yowls. Their parents keep the monster trapped in the basement. I know their parents are dead. There's a baby dead in a cot, so to speak. And the heroes have to say, don't worry, kids, we'll go in. I know that much. They're talking about the mists, doesn't really matter. Yep. They can go in the main entrance. My players went immediately for a balcony, uh, which really kind of messed it up. They were a bit ahead of the game there. Says about characters can burn down the house, but it just rebuilds itself. So yeah, the house is alive. Okay, I've got that. I'm fairly familiar with the map. There's not really any encounters as such on the first floor. So it's just a case of describing the dark oak panelling. Fine, I can do that. You know, creepy house, cabinet table, playing cards, wine glasses. Trapdoor isn't here until later. It's supernaturally hidden. Fine. A kitchen and pantry. A dubious dumbwaiter which will rise up and down. Dining room, again, elegant pictures. You know, this used to be potentially a lovely home. This picture of the Durst family when they were alive and suits of armour either side of doors and a red, blood red marble staircase spiraling upwards with a cold draft coming down straw mattresses in an undecorated room tiny servants uniforms again the dumbwaiter in the wall a library red wax candle paper a secret door behind a bookshelf disguised to look like a red covered book with a blank spine the secret room itself packed with tomes describing fiend summoning rituals and the necromantic rituals of a cult called the priest of a cybus. The rituals are nonsense, heavy wooden chest in the corner. Close inspection reveals that a skeleton in leather armour belongs to a human and triggers a poison dart trap. Clutched in the hand of a skeleton is a, a letter from Strad himself, who is not in this adventure, but he's hinted at. I'm talking about the one shot. Okay. That's fine. That's easy to remember. They have some scrolls to find. That's good. A windmill. Deed to a windmill. I've played Curse of Strahd, so that's old bone grinder. That's in my head already. Conservatory. Harpsichord. Skeletons on a picture. Okay, we go upstairs. The second, the first floor, there is a suit of armour and it attacks. I would say that I might change that to uh, a mannequin. One of those old fashioned clothes, dummy type things that you put your fine linens on because animated armor is far too obvious. You see a suit of armor, that's gonna come to life. They'll probably have been faked out by the ones downstairs, but it still won't be that surprising to find that's a fight. So I'll still use the same stats though. Another secret door, finding the secret staircase. That's kind of important and I want them to have that. So the master suite, double doors, dusty, cobwebbed, filled, empty wardrobes, tiger skin rug, picture of Gustav and Elizabeth. Again, the dumbwaiter traveling around and a little bit of treasure. My players heard screaming coming from one of these windows and, and flew or something straight up or got a ladder up or climbed up straight into which it was it was it four eight I can't remember. But yeah beautiful red staircase can show them a picture of that. Nothing much in the bathroom disappointing. Storage room okay dusty shelves again a broom of animated attack cool something to kind of jump scare them in a way. The nursemaid suite is where my original players leapt to. So 15, ah, uh, 15A on the third floor. Yeah, 
That's a DM mistake. That was on me. Shouldn't have been able to get there. So a nursemaid used to be here and there is a spectre. So if I use the monsters know what they're doing, look up spectre. Spectres can pass through solid objects. They have a fast flying speed. A spectre might be expected to zero in on weaker victims. It might act that way. They don't evaluate how easy or hard it will be. They just want to kill everybody, it doesn't matter who first. They have a scrappy fighting style. Once they've identified the target, they go straight for life drain. If it gets hurt by player one, they just wheel around and go for player two and hope for better luck. If it's getting hit upon, it will disengage, move 50 feet away and then swoop in and attack a new target. All right, that makes sense. There's another secret door in here then, okay. That's that other staircase again. The attic hall is held shut with a, the door to area 20 is held shut with a padlock, foreboding. Spare bedroom, yeah, just creepy room. Storage room, bloodstained bed. Somebody was knifed in this bed, the nursemaid. Spare bedroom, nothing of interest. The children's room, bricked up window. Toys, toy chests and doll's house. Stuffed toys, if you touch the dollhouse or the chest, the children, ghosts of Rose and Thorn appear. Well, let's look up how ghosts work. What they have is possession. Possession is cool. Because if they possess a person, the only way to break that possession is by the other players dropping them to zero hit points. I love it. It will do that more than its withering touch, but a withering touch is done for self-defense, not intending to kill. They can retreat through physical items, which will slow the players down, that's good. It has a horrifying visage, causing targets to be frightened. It does that to people who upset them the most, or I guess hurt them the most. All right, that's fairly easy to remember. If asked how they, if asked how they died, they explain their parents locked them in the attic to protect them from the monster in the basement. There's a secret door in the attic. They say, oh, there's a couple of flaws. That's interesting. When I hopefully possess a character, a character possessed by Rose gains, I like being in charge and I get angry when other people tell me what to do. By Thorn, I'm scared of everything, including my own shadow. Secret stairs go down into the most interesting level, the dungeon level. Ghostly chanting in the distance because it's much wider down here, much longer. There are empty crypts. One of them has an insect swarm in it. Children's crypts. Five side rooms have various bits of treasure. Keepsakes of the family. A hidden spiked pit in 26. All right. A fall through the floor in 26. Dining hall. A ladder with a grick. Anything cool about the grick? Its preferred method of attack is an ambush strike, but I think there's only one down here. And it's stone camouflage trait. It has multi-attack. It gets a, make a beak attack only after a successful tentacle attack. Standard. I can remember that. Okay, the ghostly chanting. There are four ghouls, but they're former cultists. Like, not zombies, but that kind of thing. Ghouls. The bite attack does more damage, but the claws have a greater chance to hit as well as paralyzing its target. Ghasts have turning defiance trait, which grants advantage on saving throws against turning just turning not just to themselves, but any ghoul within 30 feet of them. They approach the chosen prey and attack with claws. Each ghoul repeats this attack until it finally succeeds in paralyzing its prey. Then it will switch to biting, attacking with advantage with every hit a critical. Because you're paralyzed, mate. That's 46 plus two damage per bite. Or I do it different. If attacked, it can dash and pull the PC who's paralyzed away with it. But effectively, they, they do run away at dash speed. Stairs down. The Dark Lord's Shrine. Mouldy skeletons that hang from rusty shackles against a wall. A statue chanting. The statue is Strad. If a character touches the statue or takes the crystal orb, five shadows form. It's all very ghostly, isn't it? Shadows avoid light. Its stealth proficiency and shadow stealth trait define the shadow's tactic. It lies in wait, uses its bonus action and its movement to hide, approaches with stealth, and then will roll with advantage using strength drain. The DM can say you saw a shadow move past you and the fact that the shadow is a creature may not occur to the players at first. All they know for sure is that something's there. I interviewed this guy. If you haven't seen it, it's on my channel, Keith Aman. Once it latches onto a PC, it uses its strength 
drain. Average of 9 necrotic, and it reduces the target's strength by a d4 each time it hits. On zero, they die. Dead, dead. Concealed door, okay. Crystal orb, yep. Yeah. Hidden trap door, which is where you can come back up. Yeah. The door is a mimic, okay. I know about mimics quite well. Ghasts, ghouls and ghasts, very similar. Uh, some nice treasure, okay. Spells. He's the ancient, he's the land, he's the ancient, he's the land. That kind of idea. Several relics, weird relics. A prison, secret door, a skeleton hanging on the back wall, portcullis submerged in two feet of water, ritual chamber, chanting stops as you peer into this room, murky water covers the floor, rusty chains dangle, altar is stained with dry blood, yeah, 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 shambling mound, but it's actually Logoth the Decayer, so you don't especially describe a shambling mound, it's some weird thing they've never seen. It's multi-attack, lets it make two slam attacks. If both attacks hit, the target is grappled, and it gets to engulf in the same turn, blinding, restraining, and suffocating the target. If it's struck by a missile or a spell, it will move in opposite, opposite directions. On the other hand, if it's attacked from within its blind sight range, it moves toward the attackers and tries to womp them. This goes for anyone attacking with a lightning damage. It likes lightning damage. It will move full speed towards the source, hoping for more, even if the source is beyond its sensory radius. Well, that's the final boss, this horrible, stinky, smelly monster. And you're expected to kill a life, take a life to get out. I didn't spot a puppy in this adventure, as I read through this time, but when my first dealings, I had a lovely, adorable puppy. I might use a kitten this time. Basically, if they're not willing to sacrifice one of each other, they have to take the life of a small kitten. Sick. I know. That's easy to remember. Now I've been over it again. I can watch this video an hour or two before I actually run it for real. And you can watch, hopefully, that playthrough, fingers crossed, and see how I messed it up, probably. Thanks for watching. See you later.